Good morning. I am Rhonda Polinsky, and many of you here have never met me, unless you go to the 8 o'clock service, up bright and early, but since you cut, you're here at the 1030, I assume that you're not early risers. That's a good thing. How did I get to be here? Tom, Pastor Tom, was kind of a sneaky person. He came in one day and he said, oh, are you going to Colorado in June? No. What are you, have you, do you have plans for Father's Day? No. Oh yeah, well now you do. So here I am. And when Bill was talking to you this morning about being Southern Baptists and sitting in the back of the church, I just knew I had to share a few things with you. One of the chapels that I attended when my husband and I were traveling full time was set up with folding chairs. And no matter how many chairs were set up, people wouldn't sit in the first two or three rows and they would go get more chairs to add on to the back. So one day the pastor just lifted the pulpit up and went to the back of the room and had them all turn their chairs around. It was a good thing. At another time that I was serving in a church and we were going to put in new pew pads, people were upset about getting new pew pads because after all, those pew pads fit just right to your butt, right? And so we came up with a plan that if you sat in the front rows of the, the pews, it only cost you a penny. But if you sat in the back rows of the pew, it cost you $20 didn't take long until those pew pads were paid for because somebody says, I don't want to have to pay $20 every time I sit in the back row. So it worked out well. But this is Father's Day and we have come and we are blessed. So now I would like to go into an attitude of prayer that we may ask God to be with us. Gracious and loving God, you are our God. You are the one and only true God. And we are here to worship you, to praise you, and to bring honor to your name. May the words of my mouth and the words that lay upon the hearts and ears of those in attendance be the message that you have, the message that you give today, Lord. And may there be blessing in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to honor all of the fathers, the grandfathers, the great-grandfathers, the brothers, the uncles, the cousins, the friends, and the mothers who planted the seeds of faith. I know that there are mothers here that were just as active in raising their children, often by themselves. So they too were the substitute for fathers. And we are so pleased to have you here Exodus 20, 12 said, We command you to honor your father and your mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord will give you. So we will honor all of the planters of the sea. I would like to begin by asking you today, What is stronger than God? More evil than the devil? Poor people have it. Rich people don't need it, and if you eat it, you will die. No? Shall I say it again? What is stronger than God, more evil than the devil, poor people have it, the rich don't need it, and if you eat it, you will die. Joan, anything? No. Nothing. There is nothing that is stronger than God. There is nothing that is more evil than the devil. The poor people have nothing. There is nothing that the rich people need. And if you eat nothing, you will die. Now, I have to tell you, you're pretty low down on the standard of getting that riddle. There was only 17% of Stanford University students who got it, 
and 80% of all kindergarten students got the correct answer. The parables of Jesus are much like riddles. Literally, the word parable means a riddle. A parable gives the reader or listener the responsibility for figuring out what it means. And Jesus told more than 40 parables during his ministry. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still trying to figure out what they mean. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark 4, 26 through 34. The Gospel of Mark was written not by one of the disciples, but by John Mark, who traveled with Paul on his first missionary journey into Pamphylia that is now known as Turkey. He was also an associate of Peter in his ministry and heard and recorded first-hand eyewitnesses' account of Jesus' life. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel and moves quickly through Jesus' life from his baptism by John to the resurrection in Jerusalem. For John Mark, it is the foundation of the good news, or like our parable today, it is the mustard seed of the kingdom of God. Once planted, it will grow and it will grow. Some years ago, a company mailed out some special advertising business uh, cards, and there was a little seed glued on there. And on the card it said, if you have the faith as small as this mustard seed in our product, you are guaranteed to get excellent results and you'll be totally satisfied. Sign the management. And a few months later, one recipient of this promotional piece wrote back to the company and he said, you will be interested to know that I planted the mustard seed you sent on your advertising card and it has grown into a very healthy and wonderful tomato plant. Jesus wasn't trying to fool anyone as this merchant has. In using a parable, he was giving us a frame of reference that we could relate to and understand. We can visualize a tiny seed growing into an enormous bush. The people that Christ was speaking to related to this parable because they had to plant seeds and water it. It was in integral to their, to their lives. Without the plant, they had no food to feed their families. Their lives literally depended on it. Jesus uses the idea of a mustard seed and growth to teach us about Christian faith. When Jesus told the parable, he was comparing it to loving God. When people begin to love Jesus, their love is just like that tiny mustard seed before it is planted. It starts out very, very small. And as you listen and learn about him, the love grows bigger and bigger. Jesus started his kingdom with a handful of disciples. And today, each one of you sitting in this congregation are disciples. And each time we tell someone about Jesus, we are helping to grow his kingdom. Now, in the beginning, there were only a few believers, but that number grew and grew until now, nearly one-third of the worldwide population of Earth, or nearly 2.3 billion people, are believers. Now, some of you are farmers, or you're from families of farmers. And I want you to understand this parable and how it relates to your belief and your faith and the faith of others. If you are a wheat farmer from Kansas or North Dakota, you know that the sun comes out every day and then the rain comes and the seed you planted grows and sprouts. You watch it anxiously as the first stalk appears and then the head grows into a full head of grain and then you are ready to harvest. And this is exactly what happens when the seed of God is planted in us or in others. It begins to form, and as we feed and nourish it, it grows from the tiniest mustard seed into a full-grown tree. If we don't nourish and water the planted seed, it will wither and die. And the same is true for our faith. If we are living in God, 
Not only will we grow, we also make a difference in the lives of those around us. But what happens if we have really bad things happen to us and we get turned off and discouraged? I recently taught a Bible study where we drew a timeline of our lives and the bad things that happened to us, the loss of a loved one, a divorce, illness, loss of a job. Our faith could have withered up just thinking about all of the hard times. It was like a drought, a blizzard, or extreme heat and wind on a living plant. However, when we went back and we looked at those timelines, we looked at all of the good gifts that we have been given by God, and we became nourished and started to grow in our faith. Not only in our faith, but in our joy. We became like blooming flowers. Despite all of the hard times that we had been through, the weaknesses, the failures, we had thrived. When we are living in God's kingdom and looking for the good and loving those around us, like a healthy mustard bush, we will thrive. We are all planters of the seed, and the message for today is that even the smallest seed can plant a strong faith. It is up to us to feed and nourish it. God commanded that his, the stories of his mighty acts in Israel's history and his laws be passed on from parents to children. And this shows us the purpose and importance of religious education to help each generation obey God and set its hope on him. It is important, so very important, that we keep our children from repeating the same mistakes that the ancestors made. We are planters of the seed. We are the fathers, the grandfathers, the great-grandfathers, the uncles, all of those who plant the seeds of faith in our children and in others. Psalm 78, 1 through 7 tells us, O oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories that our ancestors passed down to us. We will not hide these truths from the children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob, he gave his instructions to Israel. And he commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they will in turn teach their own children. So each generation should set its hopes anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. This is Father's Day. Do you see the responsibility that we each have as fathers to teach and to plant the seeds? Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Always and everywhere, be talking about your faith. Let those around you know what your beliefs are. Lead them, guide them. Deuteronomy 31, 12 through 13. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners who reside in your towns, so they can can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of his law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So when you're in fries and the person in front of you has more than 15 items in their basket and you're a little irritated you can be the planter of a seed. 
You can be generous and kind to this person in front of you and share the good news of God's kingdom with them. Now, Jesus loved children. And even when his disciples tried to turn them away, he called them back to him and he took them on his knee and he blessed them. This parable today might be to remind all of us, the grandfathers, the great grandfathers and others, that children are important, our most important resource and our greatest responsibility. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he was, is old, he will not depart from it. Now, fathers, grandfathers, mothers, what are you doing to pass on the history of God's work to the next generation? Children are like mustard seeds. They need to be nourished to grow and to flourish. And on this Father's Day, I encourage you to be planters of the seeds in your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and all the others that you meet, even those in Fry's grocery store. Be a planter of seeds and look forward to your harvest. As a Father's Day gift, I would like to share this video of a five-year-old Claire Ryan Crosby and her father with peace in Christ. When we plant the seed, we don't always get to stay and see the harvest. Claire Ryan Crosby's father is seeing the harvest now. But maybe your children are 70 years old. Maybe you have a brand new great-great-grandchild. But it is up to you to plant the the seed and keep the kingdom of God growing. So go ahead, be a planter of seeds. Amen. <laughs> 